Welcome back to this introductory statistics course. Today we're talking about the procedure of statistical testing. In the first lecture I explained the concepts behind sampling theory. If we assume the existence of an unobserved population who has a certain characteristic, for example variable x, then we could theoretically compute descriptive statistics in the population for that characteristic. So we could calculate the population mean and the population variance. But in practice, we don't have access to the whole population. So we draw a sample from the population and we calculate the descriptive statistics in that sample. Those sample statistics are also our best guesses about the population parameters. Last lecture, I explained how we can use the standard error to express our uncertainty about these sample statistics as estimators of the population parameter. Today, we'll take this one step further and we'll use that same standard error to perform tests of hypotheses about possible values of the population parameters. So hypothesis testing is another inferential procedure. It allows us to draw conclusions about population values based on sample statistics. And these conclusions are based on probability calculus for which we will once again use the normal distribution. First, let's start with an intuitive example to understand the rationale behind hypothesis testing. I'm here in the United States and last week I borrowed a car from my aunt. She hadn't driven the car for a few months, so when we came to the car, it turns out the engine wouldn't start. At that point, we formulated a theory, and our theory was that the battery is dead. From this theory, we could deduce one or several hypotheses. One hypothesis congruent with this theory is that if we use jumper cables to start the car, is that if we use jumper cables, we could start the car. Another hypothesis consistent with the theory is that if we would charge the battery, the car would start. And a third hypothesis consistent with the theory is that if we would replace the battery, the car would start. Next, we performed an experiment. In this case, we charged the battery. After charging the battery, we observed our data, which is that the car did start. So the conclusion is that our battery was indeed dead. Now, statistical testing is similar to this intuitive example with one key difference. In the intuitive example, all we needed was one piece of evidence to conclude whether our hypothesis was true or false. We performed an experiment by charging the battery. After charging the battery, the car started. So we had evidence that our theory was correct. Indeed, the battery was dead. In statistical testing, instead of using a single piece of evidence, we use probability calculus. And this allows us to test hypotheses in the presence of uncertainty. So let's adapt our intuitive example. Let's say that we have an observation, 6% of cars from an unnamed brand have trouble starting within the first year. The manager at the factory may establish a theory that the battery of these cars has too low of a capacity. They derive hypotheses consistent with the theory and state that if the battery indeed has too low capacity, then increasing the capacity of the batteries will solve the problem with these cars. The manufacturer conducts an experiment. This car brand switches to installing larger batteries in their new models. And then they collect data. In a sample of 1000 cars of this brand, after increasing the battery capacity, 4.3% have trouble starting within the first year. So what conclusion do we draw? Clearly, 4.3% is lower than 6%. But one could ask the question, is that decrease in percentage of cars with problems larger than the difference you could expect based on pure chance? Or in other words, is this decrease significant relative to the random variation that we would expect to observe between repeated samples? In general, when we formulate hypotheses, we follow these four steps. First, we formulate hypotheses, and these could be derived from theory, which I talked about in the first lecture. A hypothesis is a testable proposition about the value of population parameters. Second, we calculate a test statistic, and which statistic we calculate depends on what quantity we are testing. In general, though, every test statistic tells us how many standard errors away from the population statistic under the null hypothesis the observed sample statistic is. 
The test statistic allows us to calculate a probability, which in the context of testing, we tend to refer to as a p-value. So every time you hear p-value, just think this is a probability. What probability? Well, specifically, this is the probability of observing a value for the test statistic at least as extreme as the one that you did observe, if the null hypothesis were true. And based on this probability value, or p-value, we draw a conclusion. And based on this conclusion, we're going to act either as if we reject the hypothesis that we tested, or as if we accept it. So let's talk in more detail about what hypotheses are. We can define theory as a systematic explanation of some phenomena. And theories can make use of causal statements. For example, we can assume that intergenerational transmission of social capital causes income inequality in subsequent generations. A hypothesis is a proposition about the population that is consistent with the theory, but that could be tested in data. In other words, a hypothesis is an assumption about the state of the world, and we must make it before we see the data. The procedure of statistical hypothesis testing was an attempt to circumvent something that is called the problem of induction. And this problem of induction, simply put, states that you cannot derive general rules from specific observations. The canonical example of the problem of induction is concluding a general rule that all swans are white from the specific observation that many swans in Europe are white. The problem is that on the other side of the world, black swans do exist. So no matter how many white swans you observe in Europe, your theory that all swans are white is simply not correct. And all it would take to disconfirm your theory is a single observation of a black swan. But if you're only ever observing specific data in Europe, you would not find that single black swan. The opposite of induction is deduction, and it is logically consistent. Deductive reasoning is top-down. You go from general rules to specific conclusions. One example of deductive reasoning is the following. Assume that all men are mortal. Further assume that Socrates is a man. From these two premises we can conclude that Socrates must also be mortal. If the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. But any time we want to make statements about the population based on sample statistics, we run into this problem of induction. Inductive reasoning is bottom-up. You want to go from specific observations to general conclusions. So an example of inductive reasoning is the following. Start with the premise. All of the swans I've ever observed have been white and draw the conclusion, therefore all swans are white. The conclusion does not logically follow from the premise because one counterexample could disconfirm it, and in this specific case, the conclusion is indeed wrong. Here's another example of the problem of induction for those amongst you who are more visual learners. So the problem holds that you can't go from specific observations to general rules because the same evidence could be explained by multiple rules. So take a look at the picture below. We see these shadows and my question to you is, what caused these shadows? You know that I am currently in America, so you might think these shadows are caused by the skyline of New York. But is this conclusion supported by the evidence? Well, here's a reveal. In fact, these shadows are caused by a container ship. I think that shadows really nicely illustrate the problem of induction because multiple objects could cast similar or even the same shadows. In other words, the observed evidence, the shadows, are consistent with several alternative truths. And you can't use only the available data to know which of these possible truths is correct. Statistical testing is heavily rooted in the work of Karl Popper. Karl Popper established the idea of falsificationism. If you can't use inductive reasoning, then you must perform your tests using deductive reasoning. So you begin with a theory, from this, you derive a hypothesis, and then you try to reject that hypothesis. And if the hypothesis is rejected, that casts doubt on your theory. So Popper defines scientific theories as those that could be tested in data and could conceivably be proven false. Any hypothesis that could not conceivably be proven false 
is unscientific. He further argues that the purpose of testing is to cast doubt on hypotheses, not to provide evidence in favor of them. So for example, if your hypothesis is that all swans are white, your task as a scientist is to go looking for black swans. So how is Popper's reasoning applied in statistical testing? Well, one way is that scientists typically formulate null hypotheses whose only purpose is to be rejected. Often, this null hypothesis is the opposite of what the researcher actually believes. Now, we could argue whether it makes sense to formulate hypotheses that do not reflect your true beliefs and whose only purpose for existence is to be falsified by data. Specifically, you will see a lot of nil hypotheses, null hypotheses that state that some value or some difference or some association is equal to the value zero. In fact, many statistical packages assume that you are testing the hypothesis that the quantity you are testing is equal to zero. If you reject the nil hypothesis, that means that you will act as if the effect is non-zero. One criticism of this approach is that the null hypothesis is not really believed by anyone. It's just a straw man whose only purpose is to be rejected. And in fact, there are alternative approaches outside the scope of this course. For example, Bayesian hypothesis testing allows you to calculate evidence in favor of a hypothesis that you believe. And there is also informative hypothesis testing and using a smallest effect size of interest. So within the context of this course, what kind of hypotheses do we test? Well, first of all, we can test equality hypotheses. For example, the hypothesis that a mean is equal to zero. That's a nil hypothesis about the value of the mean. But we could also test the hypothesis that the mean is equal to 6.4. Notice that this is the same as saying that the difference between the mean and 6.4 is equal to zero. In other words, mu minus 6.4 is zero. Another example of an equality hypothesis is saying that the mean of group one, mu sub one, is equal to the mean of group two, mu sub two. Note that this is the same as saying that the difference between mu one and mu two is equal to zero, or mu one minus mu two is zero. And we can test inequality hypotheses also known as one-sided hypotheses. These specify that something is larger or smaller than something else. For example, we could hypothesize that a mean is larger than zero. Or we could hypothesize that a mean is smaller than 6.4. And notice that this is the same as saying that the mean minus 6.4 is smaller than zero. Null hypotheses stand in relation to an alternative hypothesis. Like I said before, the null hypothesis only purpose is to be rejected. The alternative hypothesis often reflects the researcher's true beliefs. Now at this point, it's very important to talk about two different philosophical approaches to testing, which are often mixed and confused with one another in the social sciences. The oldest approach is Fisher's approach to hypothesis testing. And he wasn't really concerned with alternative hypotheses he only talked about null hypotheses. We could say, however, that in Fisher's perspective, the alternative hypothesis is any state of the world that is mutually exclusive with the null hypothesis. So if our null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to zero, then our implicit alternative hypothesis is that the mean is not equal to zero. Or if our null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to or smaller than zero, then our implicit alternative hypothesis is that the mean is greater than zero. A more modern approach to hypothesis testing was introduced by Nyman and Pearson. They specified explicit alternative hypotheses. For example, if the null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to zero, one alternative hypothesis could be that the mean is equal to 6.4. By specifying a specific expected effect size for the alternative hypothesis, we can calculate the probability that we would be able to find that effect with a sample of a given size. After we've specified our hypotheses, the next step in hypothesis testing is to calculate our test statistic. So what is a test statistic? A simple definition would be that a test statistic 
is the distance between the hypothesized population value and the observed sample statistic measured in standard errors. For a z-test, we calculate the test statistic by using the familiar formula for the z-distribution. Namely, z is equal to the observed sample mean m minus the population mean mu under the null hypothesis and dividing this by the standard error of mu. Or, if we don't know the standard error of mu, substituting the sample standard error for the mean. So this figure also illustrates what the test statistic is. Note that this distribution is the sampling distribution. And if our population mean would be the value that we specified under the null hypothesis, then our observed sample mean would be here in that distribution. The standard error tells us how far away the observed sample mean is from the hypothesized population mean. And if it's very, very far away, then the tail probability for such a value would be very small. So for example, we could say that our null hypothesis is that the mean in a population is equal to 6.4, and the standard error of the mean could be 0.2, and our observed sample statistic could be 6.8. The test statistic for a z-test would then be the observed mean of 6.8 minus the population mean of 6.4, and the difference between them is 0.4, divided by the standard error of 0.2. So that difference is 2. The test statistic is 2. So let's work through an example together. We all know that Dutch people are quite tall. Worldwide, height is distributed normally with a mean of 167 and a standard deviation of 7.5. So a hypothesis might be that Dutch people are significantly taller than the worldwide average. If we draw a convenience sample of 20 students and observe a mean height of 171, then we could test the hypothesis as follows. First, specify your null hypothesis. The population mean is 167 or smaller, and this is not what we believe, this is what we want to reject. Then, specify your implicit alternative hypothesis, namely that the population mean is greater than 167. Then calculate your test statistic for a z-test. So our observed mean of 171 minus the hypothesized mean of 167 divided by the standard error. And here we just plug in the formula for the standard error, population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And if we calculate this, we get a test statistic of 2.39. And this is a z-statistic. The next step in hypothesis testing is calculating the p-value. Statistical hypothesis tests use probability calculus to make a decision about the hypothesis. What probability do we calculate? Well, we calculate the probability of observing a sample statistic at least as extreme as we did observe, if our null hypothesis were true. So using probability notation from a previous lecture, we can write this as the probability of observing these data, given that the null hypothesis were true, or p of data bar h null. A lot of people seem to struggle with the correct interpretation of p-values. So let's get this right once and for all. The p-value is the probability of observing a test statistic at least as large as you have observed, assuming that your null hypothesis is true. Note that they do not tell you anything about the probability of a hypothesis being true. P-values are about the probability of observing the data assuming a certain hypothetical population value. So let's say that we observe a p-value of 0.0001, extremely small. The correct interpretation would be, it is extremely unlikely to observe these data if we assume that the null hypothesis is true. The incorrect interpretation is, it is extremely unlikely that the null hypothesis is true. This is wrong. Now let's say that we observe a p-value of 
The correct interpretation is that it's very common to observe these data if the null hypothesis is true. In other words, we're very unsurprised by observing a test statistic of this size if we assume that the null hypothesis is true. The incorrect interpretation is there's a 75% probability that the null hypothesis is true. Just keep in mind, you never know what the probability is that any hypothesis is true or false. You only know something about the probability of observing data, at least as extreme as you have observed, assuming that a certain hypothesis is true. It's not impossible to make probability statements about hypotheses, but this is the domain of Bayesian statistics, which falls outside of the scope of this course and uses a different definition of probability. So, where do p-values come from? Well, we're going to use the normal distribution. Before you calculate anything, you have to determine if you need to get the probability in one tail of the distribution or in both tails. If you're doing a one-sided hypothesis test, so for example, you're testing the null hypothesis that the mean is smaller than or greater than a particular value, then you are calculating the probability in just one tail. If you are calculating a two-sided hypothesis test, so your null hypothesis is that the mean is equal to some value, then you are conducting a two-tailed hypothesis test. By default, SPSS and many other programs only give you two-sided p-values. If you are doing a one-sided test, however, you need to do one additional step. If the observed effect is in the hypothesized direction, then you can divide this two-sided p-value by two. Because remember that this distribution is symmetrical, so if you want to do a one-sided test, you can disregard half of the probability mass from one of the tails. So, you divide the p-value by two. However, if your effect is not in the hypothesized direction, then it's not significant and you can't calculate the p-value. So what do we do once we have the p-value? Well, again, here there are two philosophies. The first follows Fisher. Remember that Fisher was really only interested in testing the null hypothesis and not really interested in alternative hypotheses. From Fisher's perspective, you could say that the p-value quantifies the incompatibility of the data with this null hypothesis. The more incompatible with the hypothesis the data are, in other words, the smaller the p-value is, the more skeptical we become of the null hypothesis. So Fisher says that we should interpret very small p-values as strong evidence against the null hypothesis. There is a problem with this interpretation, however which is that if the null hypothesis is really true in the population, then p-values are uniformly distributed. In other words, every value for the p-value is equally plausible if the null hypothesis is really true. And this causes a problem for interpreting the p-value as strength of evidence against the null hypothesis. The Nyman and Pearson approach is slightly different. Remember that they specify a specific null hypothesis and a specific alternative hypothesis. Under Nyman-Pearson, we can specify an alpha level and a beta level. Alpha is the probability of incorrectly concluding that you found an effect. And beta is the probability of incorrectly concluding that there is no effect. By convention, we set alpha to 0.05. That means that we accept that 5% of the times we perform a test, we draw a false positive conclusion. You can specify different values for alpha. For example, if you want to be a little bit more careful about concluding that you found an effect, then you can set smaller levels for alpha. Or if you want to be a little bit more permissive, you can set higher alpha levels. Beta is the probability that you don't find an effect, even if it really exists in the population. And we consider it to be desirable that beta is around 0.2. The problem is, however, that in order to calculate beta, you need to hypothesize a specific value for the alternative hypothesis. And most of the time, as social scientists, we don't really have good guesses for how large the effect should really be. 
So very often, researchers neglect to specify a specific alternative hypothesis and therefore they don't know what the value of beta is. When you perform your test, you compare the p-value against the alpha level. And if the p-value is smaller than the alpha level, then you conclude that you found an effect. In the Nyman-Pearson approach, this is a binary true or false decision. So it doesn't matter how much smaller the p-value is than the alpha level. Nevertheless, it is important that you report the exact p-value so that other researchers could take different approaches to inference if they wanted. The final step in hypothesis testing is that you draw a conclusion. So one possible conclusion is that we reject the null hypothesis. And as I already mentioned, we reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is smaller than the alpha level. The correct conclusion is that it's very unlikely to observe data at least as extreme as we observed, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Another possible conclusion is that we don't reject the null hypothesis. And we don't reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is greater than or equal to the alpha level. And this means that the data are unsurprising if the null hypothesis were true. Note that I only talk about rejecting hypotheses, I don't talk about accepting hypotheses. Because these procedures cannot tell me whether a hypothesis is true or not. They can only tell me how surprising it is to observe these data if we assume that the hypothesis is true. We can test hypotheses by comparing the p-value to the alpha level, but we can also use something called critical values. A critical value is nothing other than the test statistic value that corresponds to the chosen alpha level. So if we have the alpha level, for example, 0 0.05, then we can find the z value that corresponds to a tail probability of 0 0.05. So we also reject the null hypothesis when the observed test statistic exceeds the critical value. This is the same as saying that we reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is smaller than alpha because you look p up in the z-distribution. Because this critical value is nothing other than the z-value that corresponds to a tail probability of 0.05. I would advise you to memorize the following critical values. For two-sided tests with an alpha level of 0.05, the critical value is 1.96, which is often rounded to approximately 2. For one-sided tests with an alpha of 0.05, the critical value is 1.64. When we use statistical hypothesis testing, we draw conclusions about the state of the world, and those conclusions could, of course, be wrong. You could make two types of errors. The first type of error is to reject the null hypothesis, even though, in reality, it was true in the population. This is a false positive finding. In other words, you incorrectly conclude that you found something. For example, an effect, a difference, or an association. We call this a type 1 error. The second error you could make is to fail to reject the null hypothesis, even though, in reality, there was an effect in the population. This is what we call a false negative. You failed to detect an effect that does exist in the population. And we call this a type 2 error. So let's look at this in a table. There are two relevant factors here. One factor is what is the truth in the population? And the other factor is what is your decision based on your hypothesis test? In the population, either the null hypothesis could be true or the alternative hypothesis could be true. And your decision could either be to reject the null hypothesis or to accept the null hypothesis. In other words, to fail to reject the null hypothesis. If the alternative hypothesis is true and you reject the null hypothesis, then you've made a correct decision. Also, if the null hypothesis is true and you fail to reject the null hypothesis, Again, you've made the correct decision. But if the null hypothesis is true, yet your decision is to reject the null hypothesis, then you've made a type 1 error. 
and the probability of making such an error is your chosen alpha level. Also, if the alternative hypothesis is true in the population, but you accept the null hypothesis, then you make a type 2 error. And the probability of making a type 2 error is your beta level, which is often unknown unless you specified a specific point alternative hypothesis. So alpha is the risk of a false positive finding. And by convention, we typically use alpha is equal to 0.05 or a 5% risk of making a type 1 error. And beta is the risk of a false negative finding. If you specify a specific point alternative hypothesis, then you can calculate this probability beta. But even if you don't specify a specific point alternative hypothesis, several general rules apply. In general, the probability of drawing a false negative conclusion decreases if the effect size is greater in the population, or if your sample is larger, or if there is less noise in your data. In other words, if your standard deviation is smaller. There's always a trade-off between alpha and beta. If you choose a lower alpha level, then your beta level will increase and vice versa. If you are willing to commit to a specific alternative hypothesis, then you can balance the alpha and the beta level. It's also important to justify your choice for a higher or lower level of type 1 and type 2 errors. For example, let's look at the rapid COVID tests. So with these rapid COVID tests, the probability of drawing a false positive conclusion is extremely small. It's 0.001. But the probability of drawing a false negative conclusion, in other words, concluding that you don't have COVID even though you have, is quite high. It's 0.5. 50% of the time you will draw a false negative conclusion. So you might ask, is this the correct balance between alpha and beta? The consequence of a false negative is that you potentially go out and infect a lot of other people. But the consequence of a false positive is simply that you stay home unnecessarily for a few days. And this brings me to the concept of power. Power is the probability that you correctly find an effect that is true in a population. And this is nothing other than 1 minus beta. If you specify an alternative hypothesis, then you can calculate beta. And this works well for simple tests like the z-test that we're discussing today. For complex tests, however, power calculation can be very difficult. So for very complex tests, people use something called a simulation, where they create many fake data sets based on the hypothesized effect and they analyze all of these fake data sets and just calculate the percentage of times that they find a significant effect. And that is then the power. For more information about the relationship between power and sample size, you can follow the link on the screen. Here's an intuitive perspective on power that will help you understand the three factors involved. It's like looking for an object in a dark basement. The probability of you finding that object increase if the object is bigger. Applied to power, this means if the effect size is bigger. The probability of you finding that object also increases if you search for longer. Applied to power, this means if your sample is larger. And a third factor that determines how likely it is that you will find that object is how cluttered your basement is. And applied to power, this means how little noise there is in your data. If your standard deviation in the data set is smaller, you have greater power. Until now, I've explained the procedure of statistical testing based on the z-distribution. And this is convenient because we've already worked with the z-distribution for several lectures now. But today I'm going to introduce one other probability distribution, and that is student's t-distribution or the t-distribution for short. The t-distribution was developed by Gosset at the Guinness factory to solve a specific problem. Gosset wondered whether we can always use the z-distribution. Remember that to use the z-distribution, we need to know the population mean mu. Now, if we're using the z-distribution for a hypothesis test, this is simply the assumed 
population mean under the null hypothesis, so we know that. But we also need to know the population standard deviation. And much of the time we don't know the population standard deviation. So there's a problem. We rarely know the population standard deviation sigma. And the solution, as you already know from previous lectures, is that we estimate the population standard deviation using our sample standard deviation. As explained in a previous lecture, we can then estimate the standard error using a single sample by just dividing the standard deviation by the square root of the number of participants instead of dividing the true population standard deviation by the square root of the number of participants. But this solution introduces a different problem. Estimating the population standard deviation sigma based on the sample standard deviation SD introduces additional uncertainty because the SD is not exactly equal to the population standard deviation sigma. If we don't account for this additional uncertainty, then our p-values will be slightly too small. In other words, our probability of committing a type 1 error will be slightly higher. So in other words, we would reject the null hypothesis a little too easily and we increase our risk of finding false positive findings. So the solution is that we use a different probability distribution that gives us slightly higher p-values. And this is the t-distribution. The t-distribution is very similar to the z-distribution and we can say that the sampling distribution of the mean is t-distributed with a mean equal to the population mean mu0 and a standard error equal to our standard error of the mean calculated in the sample but we get a third parameter, which are called degrees of freedom. Mu sub zero is the population mean, according to the null hypothesis. Se sub m is the sample estimate of the standard error. And df are the degrees of freedom. And these degrees of freedom control how thick the tails of our distribution are. If we have lower degrees of freedom, our tails are thicker and consequently our p-values are a little bit higher. If we have higher degrees of freedom, our tails are skinnier and consequently our p-values are a little bit lower. The t-distribution is so similar to the z-distribution that as soon as we have a sample larger than approximately 30 participants, the t-distribution becomes indistinguishable from the z-distribution. So in other words, a p-value from the t-distribution can never be smaller than one from the z-distribution, but it could be slightly higher if the degrees of freedom are low. Let's look here at a demonstration of the t-distribution. So what you see here in blue is the normal distribution or the z-distribution, and in red is the t-distribution for a sample of five participants. And what you see is that the probability in the right tail of the t-distribution is slightly higher than it would have been if we would have used the z-distribution. But if we increase the sample size, let's say to 10, then we see that the difference between the area under the curve for the t-distribution and the z-distribution is already much smaller. And if we draw a sample of 30 participants, we see that they are practically indistinguishable. So how do you perform a t-test for a sample mean? Well, it's exactly the same calculation as for the z-test, except you use the sample standard deviation instead of the population standard deviation. We start with our hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the population mean for height is less than or equal to 167. And the implicit alternative hypothesis is that the population mean of height exceeds 167. Then we calculate the standard error of the mean by dividing the sample standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. Our sample is a convenient sample of 20 students with an observed mean of 171 and an observed standard deviation of 8. So we divide 8 by the square root of 20 and then we calculate our t-statistic as the sample mean minus the hypothesized mean divided by the standard error estimated based on this sample. In other words, 171 
minus 167 divided by 8 divided by the square root of 20. And our test statistic here is 2.23. We then need to find a p-value from the t-distribution. And we can either use the t-table in the Git book or any other statistics book, or we can use an online calculator for r, and then we would use the function pt, the probability from the t-distribution, based on a specific t-value and for a certain number of degrees of freedom. And we would use lower tail is true if we want the lower tail probability, and we would use lower tail is false if we want the upper tail probability. And we can also use a spreadsheet like Excel. This will only give us the two-tailed t probability using the function tdist for the absolute t value for a specific number of degrees of freedom. And then if you want a one-tailed probability, you have to divide by two if the effect is in the hypothesized direction. Finally, let's look at a few examples. Here is some output from SPSS. Let's say we're researching whether warning signs near roads influence the average speed of drivers. And we perform a test at an alpha level of 5%. So let's say that the legal driving speed is 50. First, you formulate your hypotheses. Just for illustrative purposes, let's perform a two-sided test. In this case, our null hypothesis would be that the mean is equal to 50, and our alternative hypothesis is that the mean is not equal to 50. Then we calculate the test statistic. You now know two test statistics, the z-test and the t-test. And to help decide between these two, we need to ask whether we know the population standard deviation sigma. In this case, we don't know this value. So, we have to use a t-distribution. So, calculate the t-test statistic. We take the difference between 48.5 and 50 is 1.5. And we divide that by the standard error, which is the observed standard deviation of 6.5 divided by the square root of 58. And then we get a t-statistic of minus 1.76. Then we calculate the p-value for this t-statistic, so we can look it up in a table, or we can use a spreadsheet, or we can use r, or in this case we can use SPSS, and see that the given p-value is 0.084. And then a final step is to draw a conclusion about the null hypothesis, and in this case we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The data are not surprising if h-null would be true. But remember, we were trying to slow down cars. So doesn't it make more sense to test a one-sided hypothesis? So in this case, we would formulate our hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the mean in a population is greater than or equal to 50. And the alternative hypothesis is that the mean in the population is smaller than 50. Then again, we calculate our test statistic. Well, we've already done that. And then we calculate our p-value. So because we are performing a one-sided test and the observed effect is in the direction of our alternative hypothesis, we can divide our two-sided p-value by 2. So our p-value is 0.042, which is smaller than the alpha level of 0.05, so we reject the null hypothesis. So how do we report such a test? We say, on the road with signs, driving speed was significantly lower than the legal limit of 50 km per hour with a mean of 48.5 and a t with 57 degrees of freedom equal to minus 1.76 and a p-value of 0.04. The null hypothesis that driving speed would be greater than 50 was rejected. Now a second example. Let's say that one is an alcoholic if one consumes more than 20 units of alcohol per week. Here we've drawn a sample of 28 students. And the mean in this sample was 26.57 units of alcohol per week. 
Here we perform a one sample t-test against a test value of 20 and our calculated t-statistic is 2.29. How do we get this t-statistic? Well, we take the difference between the observed mean and the hypothesized mean and the difference is 6.57 and we divide it by the standard error which is 2.87. How do we get this standard error? Well, we divide the standard deviation by the square root of the sample size. Let's go through all of the steps. First, we formulate our hypotheses. Let's say that our null hypothesis is that the mean in the population is less than 20, and our alternative hypothesis is that the mean in the population is greater than 20. Then, we calculated our test statistic. Again, we use the t-test statistic because we don't know the population standard deviation. This time, let's practice with using a critical value. So we have to find the critical value for a one-sided t-test with alpha level of 0.05 and 27 degrees of freedom. So we see in this distribution for 27 degrees of freedom and a one-tailed test with 5% significance level, the critical value is 1.703. So we reject the null hypothesis because our observed test statistic of 2.28 exceeds the critical value of 1.73. If you want to know more about the difference of Fisher's approach to hypothesis testing versus Nyman Pearson's approach, or the mix that is common in the social sciences called null hypothesis significance testing, then you can read this article by Jose Perez Gonzalez. And for a whole course on statistical hypothesis testing, I can recommend Daniel Larkins's course called Improving Your Statistical Inferences. That's all for today. Good luck in the tutorials and see you next week.